Hi everyone, I've got a talk here in two parts. So, so the first is around the project that we're looking to, to put in place. And the second part is around some life cycle analysis work that we've done comparing what we see the potential impacts of sourcing metals from the, the deep ocean with, with what we're doing today. With, with a real focus on, on battery metals and particularly the, what we, we call the green transition, transitioning from industrial in, internal combustion engines to to um, to electric vehicles, and we sort of have a premise or a, a basic, um, I guess, use case that we see. We assume that there's a, a billion EVs that are going to be required by around about 20, 2050. Um, looking at, we've got about 1.3 billion cars today, and as I think most people in the room are aware, there's a there's the, the metals are required to produce those batteries are going to produce quite quite a challenge to, to existing supply chains and we're looking at, at proposing a way forward based on the world's largest undeveloped resource for, for nickel um, and cobalt in particular and manganese, um, something that's at an order of magnitude larger than, than anything on land that's, that's, that's undeveloped. So, so with that I'll, I'll get into the story. I think most people in this room will be familiar with this, this piece here, this is um, uh, Morgan Stanley's forecast. It's a bit old now, and most of these forecasts, uh, most of these forecasts here have been growing rather than decreasing over time. Uh, most people see somewhere around about 2050 as a, as a as a point at which there'll be more EV, EVs than internal combustion engine cars, and, and really all, all driven by the, the policy changes and requirements. Uh, things like the Paris Accord and Elster to look to stay below two degrees uh, below the wall. So, so there's, a, there's a big, a big driver from from that. You look at what goes into an electric vehicle battery. Um, the, the general chemistry of batteries that, that's well established now is NMC. They are the most energy dense um, batteries. Cathode design, uh, a, a, a carbon nano, uh, nickel copper, nickel, cobalt, manganese um, uh, cathodes. Um, the 75 kilowatt EV battery seems to be about the size that the industry is um, moving to. And battery chemistries are increasingly becoming nickel rich. Um, when you look at that at a very high level, um, these are actually interestingly from, we got these from Northvolt, the, the group in Scandinavia, who are looking to build the world's cleanest battery. This is their view of the world, and they're very scared about this and this and what it means to them and how are they going to, to source supply, particularly for nickel and cobalt. Uh, similar story for, for copper. The copper curve always looks like this, but increasingly it's getting harder to find those or bring on on those five escondidas that we're going to need pretty much from 11 years from now, which is, I think, the whole industry sees as a real challenge. So security supply is one issue. Um, the other is, of course, all, all the ethics around mineral supply, which clearly the Sustainable Minerals Institute is, is, is all about. Um, deforestation, big, big for nickel that are coming out of places like um, Indonesia, and, and of course, everyone's familiar with the stories of, of, um, of child labor in the Congo. So I guess just to cut to first off a piece around what we're looking at doing and then a comparison with existing land-based resources. A polymetallic nodule very conveniently has pretty much all the stuff that goes into an EMC battery. So the, the, the battery cathode and then of course the, the copper for the wire. Um, the grades, we'll get to in a minute, but um, just to hopefully this will work. And, uh, just a quick, quick piece of history. This is a deep sea nodule, a potato-sized plum holding over 30 metallic oxides. Millions of tons of such nodules lie scattered on the deep ocean floor. The electron microscope reveals its porous crystalline structure, which accumulates layers of manganese, copper, iron, and cobalt. A cross-section suggests it grows around a pebble or shark's tooth or other seed. While growth is incredibly slow, perhaps 4,000 
thousandths of an inch every million years, the sizable nodules now cover thousands of square miles of seabed. Mysteries surround the nodules. Why aren't they buried by sediments? Why do nodules concentrate particular metals at particular rates? How do they grow? Why should they exist at all? That's a bit amusing, some, some history. But it, I guess some, some of the point here was that this is not new. A lot of this work was originally done in the <coughs> 70s. Uh, we, we've then, then taken that and moved on with it. Um, where are they? Um, basically, the location where the nodule fields are is this area here called the Clarion Clipperton Zone between the Clipperton Fault and the Clarion Fault. Um, Hawaii there, coast of Mexico, about 4,000 kilometres across, about 1,000 kilometres up, pretty much continually mineralised. Um, some areas higher grade than, than others, but the resource for the entire Clarion Clipperton Zone is that. Um, Last year, the world produced 2.3 million tonnes of nickel, so 100 years of nickel supply. Last year, the world produced about 120 kilotons of cobalt, so more than 400 years of cobalt supply. A, a truly large resource and one that's, that's game changing. If you look at 1 billion cars and you assume a 75 kilowatt hour <coughs> battery, which requires, that car requires about 80, 80 um, kilograms of copper. Uh, about 56 kilograms of nickel, there's enough um, resource in the Clarion Clipperton zone to electrify a billion cars four times over. Of interest in here, there, there are these areas here called areas of particular environmental interest. These are already national parks which have been established within the Clarion Clipperton zone as, as no take areas, um, or, already looking to, to put in place the, the, the governments ahead of them. Uh, deep green has two interests here. There's, there's one here which you'll see in later. These four areas here which you'll see in later, things colored yellow, which is sponsored by Nauru, and this one here, uh, sponsored by Kiribati. So, so what does it look like down there? So what does it look like down there? This is uh, the, the CCZ is typically, particularly in the east where we are, um, three, three and a half, three, three point eight to four point two, uh, actually about four point four thousand meters depth. Um, in the east, it gets deeper down to about five thousand, and a bit deeper. It's very flat, um, very desert-like. Um, there's not a lot of life down there, but there are. There is definitely life down there. Uh, one of the things is it isn't as well studied as we'd like, and that's one of the key challenges that, that we have at the moment. But just for comparison, if you look at the, the amount of organisms per meter squared on the bottom of the ocean, uh, compare it to a typical soil. You're looking at two orders of magnitude or slide down there. So. So as I said, a lot of work was done in the, the 1970s, um, evaluation, exploration, delineation, and then trial mining. This shows there were four major consortia working back in the 1970s. Um, here, this was the, the INCO uh, lead one, uh, produced 1,500 tonnes of nodules uh, from the seafloor. This one here was, was Lockheed Martin, and there's a, a, another piece of history I'll just run you through. Through now, it's quite amazing. This project's surface platform ship is the Glomar Explorer, notable for a complete onboard internal dry-down, which now holds the advanced design robot miner, ready for testing. 45 feet long, <coughs> 40 feet wide, and 15 feet high, it's about the size of a small house. 
a product of 16 years of research and development. The amazing thing was that this was done before, before there was GPS, before there was dynamically positioned vessels, and there's a lot of technology that's commonplace now that they didn't have access to when they did this. feel for the sort of work that was done in the 70s. Amazing technology that they managed to, to put in place there. And, and really why didn't it continue from there? And really it came down to, to governance and uh, production and, and um, administrative regime that didn't exist there. Um, there was, as a lot of that work was, was, was going on, there was the discussions around the UN Convention for Law of the Sea, which originally came into to being, being ratified in 1982, but fully came into power at least at least um, uh, what's called Chapter Chapter 11, which relates to the seafloor resources in, in 1994. Um, then there's been a, a process of uh, issuing exploration licenses from 2001. So there's been more than 15 years of, of groups exploring various parts of the the CCZ. Um, then in 2011. Um, Nori was the first company to be supported by a developing nation to undertake a contract with the ISA and there's a, there's a whole series of, of provisions and, and um, opportunities that that, that creates and through that this is that yellow area I've talked about um, before. Um, we can go into what that means uh, offline if someone's more interested and then Mar Marrow will be required for that to be Interestingly, the ISA had put the first draft of the exploitation regulations out in 2017, 
The fourth draft is now in circulation um, and they have a target um, which I think will be challenging to meet um, to have them ratified in, in 2020 by the, the ISA Council. The, the ISA is a parallel body to the UN um, created under the UN Convention for Law of the Sea. There's 168 or 168 members of the Assembly, 167 nations and the EU, and, and basically has a government structure similar to the ISA, to the UN, a General Assembly, a Council, and then various supporting committees that provide, provide um, government. So some of the work that we have done, and I guess at any mining project, starts with the, the resource, um, this is some work that we've, we've done in the last year and we're actually ongoing at the moment. The boat, this, this thing here, um, the, the launcher, is currently steaming back to, to San Diego as we speak, having just deployed some oceanographic moorings and, and taken uh, a whole series of uh, water column um, data and samples. This, this vessel here, it's an anchor handler tug supply vessel, 90 metres long, um, uh, uh, one of the 10. 10 megawatts of installed power, very powerful vessel, very stable platform, owned by Maersk, and Maersk has entered into a, into a strategic alliance with Deep Green, where they're providing the, these assets in return for equity in, in Deep Green, and, and uh, a view that they'll be one of the major shipping um, partners uh, going forwards. We retain a group called Fugro, who's here, um, providing mapping and sampling services on this campaign last year. This is the Echo Surveyor 7, a um, Cuban 1000 um, AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle. Uh, basically goes and maps the seafloor. It's got a sensor package involving a, a side scan sensor, which gives you sort of pseudo geology or bed roughness. A multi beam thimmer, which gives you accurate um, bathymetry uh, or, or topography. A um, sub bottom profile, which can see about, 50, about, about 100 metres into the seafloor and gives detailed seismic-like structure, and then a camera. These are some box cores. These things are, are basically sampling devices that, that drive the, the box into the seafloor about a half a metre. Um, when you lift it up, a shovel comes in underneath. Um, so you, you basically lift up a piece of turf from the seafloor, and it goes on, you pull it up to 4,000 <coughs> kilometres. You weigh the nodules, that gives you the abundance of nodules. You assay the nodules, that gives you the content of metals in the nodules. This is the camera feed from the AV, a series of stills stitched together. That's eight metres across, and you can see this continuous pavement of nodules. And these are pretty typical box cats, of course, from the Nori D. The, the nodules here, typical, typical in size. So the resource, we, we've undertaken a 43101 compliant resource. A few updates <laughs> to it. Um, currently, we have a, a inferred, indicated and, and measured resource. The campaign we did last year was really targeted around demonstrating the recipe. So, so we proved a little bit of, of, um, of measured, um, a bit more indicated, and, and what we're doing now is to, to fill that out so that we'll have 30 years of, of indicated resource ahead of a, of a production system and five years of, of measured, which is of, of the, of the, which will convert to resource, but of, of, the, of the reserves, which is of the yield of the little payback period. But you can see here that the, the inferred resource, 900 million tonnes of 1.3 nickel, about 30 manganese, 1.1 copper, 0.2 cobalt, which uh, gives you the order of 6.5% copper equivalent. So 900 million tonnes of 6.5 copper equivalent. I don't know of too many other resources on the planet that meet that. And remember, this is only a small piece, about 3% of the total area of the species there. So the entire resource is enormous. Just to put that into context with other undeveloped nickel deposits, uh, these are the from from the advice we had from Macquarie, the, the best undeveloped nickel uh, deposits on the planet today uh, in terms of uh, of total tonnage. That's the the, the contained nickel in the Nori, and then looking at the, the grades and the, the Nori grades. So how do, we, how do we get to a, a resource? And we can spend a, a lot of time on this, so we just have to do, need to move through this quite quickly. But we've had an AMC uh, with Ian Lipton and Matt Nimmo as, as, a, as a competent people doing this under 43101. A lot of work done on the variography of, of the sampling. 
the, the abundances and particularly the chemical grades of the nodules are remarkably consistent. The range on the, the variograms for the, the composition of nodules is of the order of 20 kilometers. So, so you, from the work and the, the um, initial simulation that Matt did, the, it, it shows that a sample that's, oh, oh, that's, um, that's seven kilometers apart using adequate measure for the metal content of the nodules. And then to get the, the abundance, that's more variable. The range there is about 10 kilometers. The, the work that I've done sampling on the order of, of three kilometers gives an adequate estimate. And you can do that using the AU photography. So what we've done this area in here with the, the outlines I've shown, that, that there is that, that, that term indicated. And this box in here is what's now, now measured. And the, the abundance is we've done taken from the, from the AU and compared it back to the top schools and the people as well. So currently within the Nori D area, that one small yellow box, there's, there's um, <coughs> just, just under 400 million tonnes of, of resource for, for measuring and 33 indicators. Interestingly, in this area, when we went from the previous sampling, which was based on, on, on the um, on free fall graphs, uh, to this sampling using the box score, which is more accurate, we ended up increasing the, the total tonnage of the resource going from inferred to indicated by 51%. So it actually went up rather than down, which is as you know only do. So just to give you a feel for what we do. I'm Warwick Miller, I'm a geologist by training. I'm here representing a company called Leap Energy. And we've been uh, subcontracted to classify, photograph, weigh, and report all the modules that are collected in the box score program. So that's the box score. You can see it. So, so basically, that, that's the piece of, around the, the resource. Um, we, we, it's incredibly large and it's incredibly consistent, and the grade of the nodules are incredibly consistent. So, so there's a, a strategy that, that Deep Green has put together around putting this pro, project together, really where we can see our expertise with the, with the ecosystem we've developed around us, around the resource, and then the inter interaction with customers, which we've been spending the last two years dealing with all the EV manufacturers. And, and getting them involved in the idea that there's a, a cleaner and better way of, of sourcing the metals that they're, they're challenged with. And then developing strategic partnerships on the, the capital intensive and, and also expertise intensive piece around the design and engineering of the offshore system and also the design and engineering processing. So today we've entered into two strategic partnerships, the one with MERS, which we showed you a, a bit of before, but also with, with all seeds to, to develop a, a collective test, which is one of the requirements under the ISA regulations to put in place that test. Um, and then ultimately for them to build and operate and produce an offshore uh, mining system uh, to produce like the Nori D devices. So what does that look like? Well, who is all seas? All seas arguably are the owner of the largest vessel on the planet, the, the pioneering spirit, a uh, heavy lift and also pipe lay vessel. Um, about three, 300 meters, 380 meters long, 100 meters wide. Basically, this thing here comes along. This is the Brent Bravo platform, 26,000 tons. It comes along. It connects to these lifting jacks. Um, cut the cut the cut the legs and lift off the, the platform in one hit. Has the record as the single single heaviest, largest heavy lift on the planet of 26,000. They're, they're, they're doing this, they're just positioning in deep green um, and also providing this expertise is that for equity in, in deep green. Um, and the, the project manager they had built this is the project manager on the project um, looking at the, 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 the scope of the Nori project. And they currently have 50 engineers working on this. So it's a, a group that has, has a history of innovation in deep sea engineering. Um, and also can has it's privately owned with a lot of capital and is putting a lot of force into this. So what does the system look like? Very simplistically, 
a, a series of tracks, remote operated vehicles on the seafloor, uh, using a, a pump system to the, to the surface through a steel riser. That the base case we have is using an airlift riser, which means big compressed air compressors on, on the <coughs> vessel, uh, injecting air about 1.2 kilometres down, using that to provide the energy to the surface, transfer the nodules um, using using slurry to, to a vessel sitting off behind, and using decantation weirs to, to, to separate the nodules and then pump the, pump the material back at depth. The, the, the crawlers themselves um, are based on existing technology uh, used in, in um, pipeline trenching. There are a number of track trenching vehicles, um, both physical and, and jetting, uh, of the same size using very similar components. There isn't a device that looks exactly like this today, um, but the components, the control systems, the electric motors, the tracks, the pumps, or all of those components that exist today. So one of the things that we've been very focused on is developing a, 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 a processing system that, that takes the nodules and produces products, uh, manganese silicate for, for silico manganese alloy production, nickel and cobalt um, uh, sulfate powders, copper cathode, and ammonium sulfate without any significant waste streams in that tunnels. So how do we do that? So really, it starts with the nodules themselves. Uh, there's no tailings on the seafloor. There's a clue, which we can get looking into later if we have time. Um, but basically, pick up the, the nodules. Um, then in the processing, one of the key advantages of, of the nodules is there's very little in the way of deleterious elements. Um, there's, there's Arsenic less than 40 ppm and timidly less than 40 ppm, less than 1 ppm mercury in the, in the nodules. And it's because they, they, they precipitate from seawater. And they're, they're remarkably efficient at concentrating nickel, copper, and cobalt, um, but very conveniently don't have much in the way of, of um, deleterious elements. Because the site is located on, on tide water, there's an opportunity to, to place the process anywhere that makes sense, close to, to um, uh, consumers, <coughs> and also close to hydroelectricity, which provides both cheap power and, and clean power. Um, the, the process we're looking at, which I'll show you now, is a, is a combined uh, pyrometallurgical, hydrometallurgical process using existing technologies that are, that are all the bits that are used somewhere else already today, um, but combined in a way that is unique. And then, then we did challenge Hatch, who did all this work for us, to, to come up with ways of, of doing this without using any waste. We do end up with some reagents that are more expensive than others, so particularly ammonia rather than sodium um, for, for the base fighting agent. But it means we end up with a useful uh, product, ammonium sulfate fertilizer, rather than sodium sulfate stuff that you've got to source them. So this is the flow sheet. Um, and actually we've got rid of these now. Um, basically a rotary kiln, electric arc furnace, which is pretty standard technology, ceramatoso type uh, nickel, nickel laterite production. A lot of the ferro nickel in, in, in Indonesia is produced that way. Um, the product out of that, so the slag product <coughs> is a manganese rich silicate, uh, grading 40% manganese, so, so high grade manganese, uh, with interestingly a very high Manganese iron ratio of 25, <coughs> which is very attractive, and also a very high manganese phosphorus ratio of 6, 670. So it is an ideal product to make silico manganese. Um, converting, this basically um, adds some sulfur to the, the metal, which comes out of here. So the other phase is an iron, um, nickel, copper, cobalt metal, it's almost very hard. Um, goes in, adds some sulfur to it to produce the mat, and then blow it to get rid of the iron. <coughs> That produces a, a low grade um, slag, which is suitable for road aggregate rail ballast as a cement additive. Um, remember, there's no arsenic, no intimidity, no mercury, none of the nasties. So this stuff's benign, um, useful, just not, not valuable stuff, but you can, you can use it just in construction. Then, then basically a, a fairly standard refinery to produce copper cathode, um, battery, battery grade um, copper and nickel sulfate, and then, as I said, it's not showing here, ammonium sulfate fertilizer. 
This work was all done by, by Hatch. We completed a PDA on this in, in April 2019. And we're going through the, 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 the benchmark testing of this at the moment. And then in, in early next year, we plan to collect a 150 ton sample to, to do this at scale. So as I said, we're, we're looking to, to do this at scale um, from, from from um, early stage, early part of next year to get the sample, and then through next year and the following year. Uh, one of the challenges is there isn't a truck test facility that can do all of this at the scale that we need anywhere in the planet. Uh, the the fire I met, the, the kilns are probably in, in Pennsylvania, which we we're talking to now. The furnace is in South Africa, and then the refining can probably to do in Canada. So it's, it's quite a logistical challenge to, to, to do the test work. One of the key things we want to get out of that is, is some, some material that we can get to get to customers. And so, as I said, we've got quite a lot of degrees of freedom around where we can locate this facility. Uh, we've got a, a number of key inputs, uh, clearly the shipping of nodules, the source of, of, of electric power, the electric arc furnaces draw a fair bit. An existing deep water port, we, we do need gas to run the kilns. Um, proximity to manganese customers because that's the largest volume um, of, the, of the products that we're looking at and then, um, then the right fiscal position. And so we've got a short list of, of these, these um, countries that came out of the study done by a spin-off from FLIR um, and we're, we're going through working through the second phase of these to find the specific sites within those locations of work. So from the, the PA that we, we did, um, there's a there's a 200 page document that's some, some, some degrees more detailed than most PEAs. But this is, this is looking at the, the C1 costs um, put together from, from the Wood McKenzie cost curve 2000, uh, 2019, showing that we'll, we'll be at the, the bottom of the cost curve on a, on a byproduct, um, net byproduct basis. So, so the only people who can do it better is the else, and similarly, the, the high precious metals there to make, make their you know, product um, attractive. So, so I guess this is a piece of work that we've been spending the last nine months working on saying, taking the premise that the world is going to need a lot more battery metals for all the battery metal batteries that are going to be produced. And where should they come from for the lowest environmental impact? And, and as, as well known, the, the largest resources of nickel tend to be in Indonesia and the Philippines as laterites in the equatorial rainforest, cobalt from the Congo versus potentially sourcing them from the, the deep ocean. So we've, we've had a, a, a fairly focused team on this. Um, Dana is ex McKinsey analyst. Steve Katona invented the, with, with Greg, who is on the board of, of Deep Green, invented the Ocean Health Index, so, so come from very much a, a conservation background. Erica X is um, McKinsey plus um, robotic mining and um, uh, and also space space robotics uh, myself supported by a, a group of, of people that sort of around um, various universities and experts in the field were told northeast you know carries um, quite involved in it and so so I'll give you a feel for the the, the, the so as I said, we sort of started with the premise of we need a billion vehicles by about 2050, and 20, 25 kilowatt hour battery requires those inputs. Where can you get them from? You can get them from land. You can get them from landfills. A lot of people say, why don't you just get them from landfills and, and recycle? And we, we, we will, we would like to, but at the moment this isn't enough metal in the system. Well, we can get them from the ocean, and there's various different sources in the ocean, but the one that really makes sense are the nodules. So we went into a comparison of saying, okay, if we were to source these, these ores on, on land versus, versus the sea, what would it mean? So we took a, basically a life cycle analysis assessment using the existing literature, or all of the work that's been done in the literature on mining. Um, uh, inputs and, and outputs, and, and looking at our cradle to gate analysis, so looking from the, the very front end to, to basically those, those products. 
at, at the gate or, or, a, or a, um, a battery manufacturer. And, and trying to do it on as much an average way as possible. So, so we, we follow the standard life cycle analysis templates, which basically breaks everything into to seven impact categories. And so when, when we, we do that, we look at the, the various various inputs, and there's, there's a lot on this, and there's a white paper that, that, that uh, Rick has, has a copy of and is looking to comment on us. But comparing things like the amount of land used, um, land and seabed use, climate change, the amount of greenhouse gas produced, the, the, the habitat damage in terms of the amount of solid waste and, and the, the impact on, on people. So when, when you look at the amount of ore that's needed to produce a, a, a billion batteries from the deep, deep ocean, we need six, six billion tonnes of nodules, we need 25 billion tonnes on, on land. Land use, of course, um, this, is, this is taking on average the footprint of the the mines that will be required to do that, and the, the processing plant will be had significantly less. Um, forest use, of course, significantly less, but we're assuming that there will be some impact from, from our facility. Um, seabed use, of course, much more. Um, water use, significantly less in terms because of that we don't have the mine and process water. But you know, I'll show a little bit more of this a little bit later on, but when you look at the, the carbon inputs that, that would be required, compared to existing mines to produce those materials, which are going to use 1.4 gigatons of, or produce 1.4 gigatons of carbon. But we're looking at something that's about 30% of that. And particularly when you start looking at, at carbon sinks and reservoirs and the clearing required, it, it makes a significantly low carbon impact. Similarly, waste, um, as we showed, we will produce um, metals with no waste on the seafloor, no, no, no impoundment facilities. No tailings dams there, no tailings dams at the treatment facility, and the, the estimates to reduce that the, the billion of batteries um, from land will produce 64 billion tons of waste. So a significant impact. Uh, waste has both mine waste and, and also tailings. And given given the view of the world of the tailings, I, I think that's a significant advantage. So just. What, what, what are some of the drivers? As we said, high grade resource, uh, you just need a lot more stuff. And you, you basically got three mines versus versus one. Um, just this is sort of a, I find quite an interesting context. This is Alvora. This is the, the open pit, and this is the estimate of all of the copper that ever came out of that open pit. So, copper mining is incredibly wasteful. You know, when 99% of the stuff you dig up goes to waste. And then just similarly, just even in terms of direct force, we need four times more. And <coughs> you know, toxic, um, big waste. Um, one of the things we looked at is if we took the existing land base, um, the, the paradigm today, and said, okay, what, what will the mining industry likely improve on? So, so it took that off the carbon um, impact, but then also took into account the Increasing grade, and then when you look at land mining today, to produce a, a billion batteries, you, you need 1.7 gigatons of carbon. If you if you look at electrification um, of, of the mining fleet, all of the opportunities there are to decrease uh, carbon, and then you also take into account the, the falling grades, you can get that down about 1.4, and we're looking at from from nodules based on the work that we've done on our on our PDA. And having an independent review, we're looking at some of the things. Um, and then, then looking at the issues around uh, around um, area and similar issues. So I guess that's 45 minutes. I've got a lot more material I can go through, but I think it's probably useful to stop it there and, and take questions. I guess if anything <coughs> come up, I can relate some more.